Amen. Well, welcome to Thursday night. Here we are coming together to you over the airwaves digitally. Um, I can't wait to see you face to face. We will someday soon, and that's going to be a good, glorious time. But in the meantime, while we reach each other through uh, the internet, um, we get to read and learn about this man, Joshua. We're in the book of Joshua. We just finished Deuteronomy. We completed the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and here we are transitioning into the book of Joshua. And, um, this leader that uh, Moses uh, uh, laid his hands on and anointed and blessed and authorized to be the next leader of the children of Israel, and he was to lead these uh, ragtag group of people into the promised land that God had promised for all those years, 40 years in the wilderness, striving and getting blessed by God and going against God and doing all kinds of things, but yet the generation passed that couldn't go into the promised land, Moses dies, and here we have the book of Joshua. Lord, bless your word as we uh, open our Bibles to the book of Joshua. So grab your Bible and open it to chapter one. We pray your blessing upon your word, God, that our heart would be uh, open to hear and understand and perceive and then to obey, Lord, what you've called us to do and what you're showing us through this glorious word and this amazing transitional historical book between the Pentateuch and the books of the history of Israel that are coming, Joshua through Esther. It's amazing. So Lord, thank you for this time. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of the message is Do Not Be Afraid. Do Not Be Afraid. And this is one of the commands that God gave to Joshua. Do not be af afraid because Joshua might have had a tendency to fear. You know, he's being put, thrust into this position of leadership, but through his day to day faithfulness and obedience and trusting God, Moses and God alike saw this man, Joshua, to be the one who could take the mantle and lead the children of Israel and fight the battles that they're going to have to fight to get the land that he promised them. So the book of Joshua is an amazing book. It's the first of 12 historical books, Joshua through Esther. And the book of Joshua provides us a link between the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and Israel's history, the following 12 books between Joshua and Esther. But through three major military campaigns involving more than 30 enemies, the people of Israel learn a crucial lesson under Joshua's firm and solid leadership. God-ordained leadership, I should say. Israel's victory come not, through, not only through faith in God and obedience to his word, but never was a battle won through their military might, their superiority, or through their numbers on the battlefield. But it was always that God was with them. God fought their battles for them. Do you, do you, do I, do I need God to fight my battles today from this day forward? Yes. I can't fight anymore. There's no fight left in me. I'm weak. I'm tired. I need the Lord. You need the Lord. He wants you to need him. And when you're weak, he is made strong in you. If you boast all the more in your weakness, Christ's power will rest upon you, child of God. And if you're not a child of God, I'm going to give you an opportunity to become one today. And that's toward the end of this sermon. But Joshua, the title of this book, which is so amazing, 
it can be found in scripture where, where Moses actually changes the name of Joshua. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 8, Joshua's original name was Hosea, Hosea, which means salvation. Hosea, H-O-S-H-E-A, something like that. Hosea, which means salvation. But then in Numbers 13, 16, Moses changes Joshua's name, Hosea, to Yahoshua, Yahoshua, Yahweh is salvation. So his name got changed from just salvation because it's not in his strength. Joshua is not the savior in his own strength. His name got changed to Yahweh is salvation, Yahoshua, Yahshua, Jeshua. And J- Jeshua or Yeshua is the shortened version of Yahashua. And it's the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek name uh, Jesus, or Jesus, which is Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Joshua is a type of Jesus. His name basically means the Lord is salvation or Yahweh is salvation. It's amazing. Joshua's name is a symbolic of the fact that not only is he the leader of the nation of Israel during the conquest, but that the Lord is the conqueror. It's not just his name. It's not just the man. It's the Lord in the man. The God behind the man. Yahweh is behind Joshua. And that's how the battles are won. And that's how our battles are won. When God is with us. And how do we get God to be with us? Accept his son Jesus. Ask Jesus into your heart. Say, Jesus, save me. Say, Jesus, come into my life and change me and let me be the man or the woman you want me to be. And he will. And he'll lead you just like he's leading the children of Israel across this Jordan to, into the land of promise. He'll lead you. He'll lead me. He'll be faithful to you because you've cried out to his only provision for your salvation, his son, Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing is that Joshua, Joshua can be looked upon as like a type of Jesus, like leading us from this wilderness of an empty life without God into a promised land of eternal life in heaven where we're going to be with God forevermore and we get blessings here on earth while we're with him and we love him and we submit to him and obey him and trust him and call on the name of Jesus, but then we get eternal life after that too. It's amazing. We are like in the wilderness on this earth. We're blind leading the blind. We don't know where we're going sometimes. I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. I need to ask God, Lord, what is going on with the world today? How can it be so upside down and this virus is everywhere and I'm, there's so much fear everywhere and everyone's in fear and they can't even look each other in the eye and it's like, stay away from me. God wants you to cast your fear upon him. Cast your worry upon him. He cares for you. Cast your life upon Christ and he'll take you into his arms and he'll carry you and he'll protect you and bless you and lead you. What a blessing this book is for such a time as this. Joshua, amazing. I want to pray again as we open it. We're into chapter one, verse one. Lord, bless this word. Thank you again for it, Lord. I think we need more prayer. I think we need to pray more. I think we need to call out your name, God, in our homes when we're alone and we can't go out and we need something. We need answers, God, and only you have the answers to life, and only you have the answers to death. Thank you, Lord, that you have all the answers. Why? Because you made us. You created us, God, and you call us by name to come to your only begotten son and just say three words, Jesus, save me, and he will. And if you believe in your heart, God, raised Jesus from the dead, you're going to be saved for with the mouth Salvation is made with your confession and with your heart. You believe that God raised him from the dead into salvation and 
all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is um, Romans 10, 13. So Lord, thank you, God, that you've called us to be set free and saved like, and lead others too, Lord, like this Joshua is filled in the spirit, blessed and anointed by you to lead these people not only valiantly into battle, Lord God, but into this promised land that had been awaited for for so long. So Lord, thank you. Joshua chapter one, verse one, do not be afraid. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. So when the lawgiver died, Moses, Remember, Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, the law. God gave the law to Moses, and then the Moses gave the law to the people. When he died, God had prepared his successor, his assistant, Moses' assistant, who was ready to lead the children of Israel into battle, for the promised land. Now, the promised land was a gift, but it was going to take a battle to get it, as we'll learn. But as Moses saw that Joshua could be trusted in small tasks as his assistant, he knew that one day he could be entrusted with a greater task of hearing God and obeying his laws, valiantly going into battle for the sake of the people, leading them into the promised land, If you're faithful in the small, God will make you faithful in the lot. Just like here we see Joshua. And just like Joseph uh, back when he was faithful to God, when his brothers sold him out. Lord, thank you that we don't have to know, memorize the whole Bible and know your word in and out and and, uh, know everything there is to know. All we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and be saved and be faithful in a little bit day by day and God will make you faithful in the lot. And he'll say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my kingdom. Enter into the throne room of heaven with me because you were faithful in just little bits. And it's bit by bit. It's called sanctification. It's a big word. It just means simply getting better Day by day, I'm better and closer to God today than I was yesterday. You're sanctified. It's, it's a good thing because God is all loving and he wants success for you. And he promises that he'll finish the work in you that he's completed until the day of Christ Jesus when Jesus comes back. But notice here in verse 2 how God was now speaking directly to Joshua. God gives him his first command and he he commands him to bring all this people into the promised land that God had prepared to give them. Now check out verse three. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread, I have given to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great sea, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, from the east to the west, from the north to the south, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Wow. That is a promise to behold. Underline that and highlight that. This can be a promise to you. For all who call upon the name of the Lord, this can be a promise directly to you as well. As God was with Moses, as God was with David, as God was with Joshua, so he'll be with you because you're with his son, Jesus Christ. And nobody can take you out of his hands No man shall be able to stand before you in opposition, ultimately removing you from the kingdom or removing your promises. No man can do that. Only God can take away like that. No man can do it. Verse 5, no man's going to be able to do this, Joshua. 
Joshua needed a little encouragement here because, man, this is his first time out and God's backing him up big time. He said, I'm with you. I'm with you. I will be with you. Look at that, verse 5. And I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. That is such a good promise to us. This promised land was given to them by God. It was given to them. And many people read, well, God gave it to them. Why do they have to fight? Well, you know, they could only possess and dwell in the areas to which they claimed. Every place the sole of their foot would tread, they, God gave it to them, it says here. And all that land could be taken, but it must first be fought for. Against all odds, through three major military campaigns, fighting against just numerous war-hardened, ready-for-battle, godless nations. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 through 2, God had already warned the children of Israel of the necessity of future battles that it would take in order for them to redeem this promised land, but that, the, but that it would be the Lord. It would be, he would be the one who would deliver them and would deliver their enemies into his hands. Let's, let's read that really briefly here. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 2. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, And he has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God, underline that, delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show any mercy to them. That's what he promised them. But they had to do the battle. They had to fight for it. Because the taking of the promised land, because it took effort, the battle for the land uh, was before them. And it wasn't um, like this battling for the land. It wasn't intended for the faint-hearted. It wasn't intended for those who looked back to Egypt and wanted to go back to Egypt. No. These were for the ones who wanted to move forward with God and do things God's way in his timing and those who were willing to wait upon God. Because sometimes you could go out into battle too soon before the Lord said to go and get you get slaughtered. And that happened a couple times. But God wants his people to hear him and obey, trusting and relying fully upon him as his specially chosen people. Amazing. And you who accept Jesus into your life are also his chosen people, not in the sense that you're a Jew, but you're a Gentile and you become his child. And then you become his friend. And Jesus even said, I don't call you servants, I call you friends because I tell you everything my father has told me, I tell you. (laughs) You're friends and you're his children. And then you become, this is going to get a little bit, you become his wife as the bride of Christ and we're waiting for our groom to return and he's coming any day. He's coming very soon. Are you ready? Am I ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Be ready. Accept Jesus. Say, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Jesus, save me. Deuteronomy 14, 2, talks about God's specially chosen people, the Jews, the children of Israel. It says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, that's a, that's a huge blessing, but it's a huge responsibility. With blessing is a huge responsibility. The more blessing, the more responsibility. If you're God's chosen people, man, what a high standard you gotta live to, live up to, right? Wow, well Jesus set the standard and now we can live and fulfill all of the Old Testament law and prophets and everything by loving one another as Christ loved us, loving God first and loving one another. Jesus said it, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. And that you love one another. And the whole world will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And no greater love than this than a man to die for 
uh, a friend. And yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so, wow, we become God's children, not, not just his chosen people, but his child. That's an amazing responsibility. So how do we act now? Do we go out and do the things we used to do in Egypt in the old way? Or do we go across the Jordan? We go to the promised land and do things God's way and walk in the spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Egypt, promised land, spirit, Egypt, flesh, battling in the wilderness. Which way do I go? I don't know. I love God. Go by the spirit. Walk by the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't go back. Go forward. Do not be afraid. Victory was never assured just because Joshua was was some great leader or just because Israel was God's special people. It was because God is a great God. And when he said to Joshua, do not be afraid, the key is, I will be with you. That's how we are all assured victory if God is with us. This should be enough for any man seeking God to do his will and to obey him. It's just to, just to know that I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Oh, that gives you strength. That gives you confidence when you can go out in the Lord. I'm not talking about confidence itself. Confidence in him that you can talk to any man, any woman, any person, king, priest, prophet, You know, anybody, boss, friend, neighbor, acquaintance, anybody you can talk to because the Lord is your helper. Amen. Can I hear an amen from you guys from outside of time? I don't know where you're at, but I heard that. So amen. Amen. Joshua is called by God to be strong. Look at verse six. God says, be strong, Joshua, and be of good courage, not just strong, not just strength, but be courageous. For to this people you shall divide it as an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. It says it again for emphasis that you, why? that you may observe to do all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Joshua is called by God to be strong and very courageous. Do you know it takes courage to accept Jesus? It's not a crutch, and you're not weak. You're strong. Why? Because you realize there's no strength in and of yourself. You're humbled now. You've humbled yourself in the sight of the Lord, and that brings great strength. And that strength, knowing that God is in control and, he has, and he's with you, brings you great courage as well. Very courageous. We need to be courageous. It takes courage to accept Christ. And I know that courage is welling up in your heart right now and you're accepting him even if I'm speaking in your heart right now. Hallelujah. Bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. God is good. But check this out. God reveals an internal weakness to Joshua. God calls him to be strong and very courageous and this is exposing Joshua's internal weakness, I believe, to himself. So even a great leader like Joshua needs to be encouraged directly by God himself. Now, you may be inherently a leader inside, and you may say, I got this. You don't got it. Well, as soon as you start to say, I got it, you don't got it. God has to have it. Yield that I got this to God and humble yourself and 
God will reveal your internal weakness to you, my internal weakness to me, in order for him to become strong in us when we surrender our weaknesses to him. We learn this practice, and this is a practice, to submit our weaknesses to God from the Apostle Paul when Jesus Christ spoke directly to him. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul then says, I therefore boast all the more in my weakness that Christ's power may rest on me. I boast in my weaknesses. I'm a weak guy, man, physically, emotionally. But spiritually, in the Lord, I can stand before any man. I may not be able to fight anybody and win physically, but no one's going to send me to hell. Amen. No man can take my salvation away. Amen. That's the point. That's where your courage is. Because ultimately, only God can remove your sin. Only God can give and take salvation. And he never takes your salvation away once he gives it to you. That's the beauty of God. He doesn't take back. When he gives you salvation, it is yours and you are assured. But that doesn't mean you can just go in your old ways and sin anymore all the time and do whatever you want, when you want, how you want. There's an accountability. Remember remember what I said about having great responsibility for great blessing? Now we're responsible. Oh, shoot. Now I can't go do what I want, when I want, how I want. But God actually reveals new desires you didn't even know you liked. And he develops your heart into something greater than you ever thought imaginable. And it's wonderful. He, he draws out of you your natural talents to bless others, to bless your family, bless your neighbors, bless your coworkers with what God's put inside of you. He, it's like a, um, a dead seed that's in there. It's dead and it can't be made alive except by God's spirit. When he does, it blossoms and you become something greater than you were before in the spirit. Now your body may get worse. You may be weaker physically in a sense that you don't rely on the strength of yourself anymore. You rely on God's strength. But it's a wonderful place to be. So God could reveal our internal weaknesses in order to make us stronger. And this bold courage would not be of Joshua's own strength, but it is in his faith in God's strength being able to be utilized through him as a vessel that God can use his strength through his weaknesses Why? So God gets all the glory, and he deserves it. You don't get the glory. Oh, look what I did. No, look what God did through me to you. That's the point. And Joshua was prepared to hear God's command and to do his will all the time, whenever, whatever, and wherever that may have taken Joshua. He was ready to do it, and that's where God brings us. Look at verse 8. Look what happens. This book of the law. It shall not depart from your mouth. God's still speaking to Joshua, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all that is according to it, all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Where does our strength come from? It comes through meditating upon God's word day and night. Why? That we may be able to observe it and to do all that is written in it. And if we do, then we'll make our way prosperous and we're going to have good success. God's word is the source of all life. Now, this may not be the kind of success you want. You may see success as having $10 million in the bank, three houses, um, a fleet of cars, maybe a boat, Um, you know, vacations twice a year. You may have all these illusions of success. But God's definition for success with you is different for every person. Because God says we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And it's a personal relationship. And God will give you success 
for where he wants you to be. But you need to be ready to let God have his way. And that's what Joshua did here. And that's why God is saying, don't forget the word. Don't forget to meditate on it because my word is life and my word is the source of life. And that's where all good success and healing and virtue and help come from. My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, and he spoke the worlds into existence, and he made you, he made me, he made everything, and he made a way, Jesus Christ. And now in verse 9, God is going to continue to encourage Joshua. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's a beautiful thing. God gives this final encouragement to Joshua before entering the promised land. Repeated from verse five, it reminds me that Joshua could only be courageous if God was with him. Mm, If God was with him. It's amazing. God was gonna be with Joshua wherever he went. Joshua was entering into unknown territory with many enemies to fight and battles to be won. He had to rely upon God alone for the victory. It's the only way you and I can have victory in this world over sin, victory over our past ways and our habits and things that easily bring us down. The only way to have victory over these things is trusting God, walk with him in the cool of the day, meditate on his word, obey his commands, and love one another as Christ loved us, and love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's amazing. Look at verse 10. Look at the, look at the power now. Look at the courage and the power and the authority that, that are in, is infused um, into Joshua now as he commands God commands him, God empowers him, God authorizes him, strengthens him, and now he speaks. Look at this, verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, prepare provisions for yourself. Within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Waiting for God can be difficult. If you're taking notes, Psalm 46.10. Be still and know I am God. Three days to enter the land. Prepare yourselves three days. That was a lot to prepare. It took them three days to pack up and get ready and prepare. But in all this preparation, in all this waiting, in all this time of expectancy and waiting to get into that promised land, they're waiting Faithfully, but they're also doing what they've been called to do. So sometimes being still and knowing that he is God is being still before his word, reading his word, meditating on his word. Sometimes being still before the Lord is hearing him and not jumping out and doing what you think you should be doing, but just waiting. But then he tells you to go left when you wanted to go right. He wanted you to go up and you went down. There's, there's certain ways. You're working out this relationship with your God. You're hearing his voice. You're obeying his command. No preacher can tell you how to obey God. It's an individual way. You, you, but you, you can learn how to obey by reading his word and gaining faith and um, speaking with other brothers and sisters and sh- iron sharpening iron, getting experience, falling down and getting up and learning your lesson and doing it right the next time. But these three days also reminds me of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ where he's buried for three days. Three, death, burial, resurrection, buried for three days, The disciples saw their Lord on the cross, tacked to the cross, dead. And they took him down and they embalmed him, as it were, and they wrapped him and they put him in the tomb and they waited and they thought he was gone. They didn't even believe it when Rhoda, I think it was Rhoda, the little girl came back and said, I I think the Lord's here. You know, the Lord, he's risen, you know, and then they shut the door and like, oh, he can't be here or something like that. But, But point being is, 
whether I'm wrong or right about Rhoda, it doesn't matter. The point being is the disciples didn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. He's risen? No. And then Peter gets up and John, they start running to the tomb to find their Lord, you know? And, and it's like, what, Lord? You, you rose again? Why did you rise again? So that I could rise again. So that my dead life could have life and I could be risen to do your will and to follow your ways and to, and to walk in your uh, path, Lord God. And, you know, we're all waiting in our homes right now for something to happen. We're all waiting. Every single one of you is waiting for the governor or the mayor or the president to say, you're free. You can go out now. Go. Go out of your home. You're all waiting for it, right? I'm waiting for it. I don't like to be cooped up in my house. It's craziness. It's, it's freaky. It's weird. It's different. This, these are different times, right? But you know what? While we wait, while we're slowed down, while we have time, may we meditate on God's word. May we pray and humble ourselves and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways that God would hear from heaven and heal our land. Let's pray right now. I just want to pray for our nation and our, our state and our county and our city and our neighborhoods and our family and our friends. Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would hear from heaven, Lord, as we humble ourselves and we pray and we ask you, Lord, to intervene. Inter- intervene on our behalf. Lord, this is out of control. We don't have any control over this thing. We need you, God. We cry out to you, Lord, as a nation. We thank you, Lord God, that you've placed people in power that love you. And, and Lord, for the ones who don't love you, may they turn to you, Father. Lord, thank you for... Um, our president and, and our vice president and our cabinet, Lord, who, who pray and seek you. And I pray for favor and blessing and, and protection, Lord, and that it would filter down through into the, the governors, Lord, that they would find favor with you, Lord, as they seek you. And the ones who don't, Lord, would, would just be wiped out and just w- cry out to you right now in their homes, Lord, wherever they are before they go to sleep. Lord, they would wrestle with life and then you, you would wake them up under righteousness and they cry out in the name of Jesus. Say, Jesus, save me. I can't govern this anymore. I don't have any control. I need you. And that would filter down to our mayors of all of our cities and they would cry out, I need you. And that would filter down to our communities, Lord, and our sheriffs and our police and all the people on the front line, God, that you give them strength to endure, Lord. They're, they're putting all their labors 12, 14 hours a day helping, trying to protect the populace, Lord, all of us. And we're scooped up in our homes. God, may we all cry out to you and say, God, save us, help us. Jesus, help us. We love you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And look at this, verse 12, to the, to who they're, um, to the Reubenites and to the, the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke to them saying, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you saying, the Lord your God has given you the rest of, the Lord God has given you rest and giving you this land. You, your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan, on the east side. So the tribes which decided to settle on the east side of the Jordan River these were the lands that Israel had already conquered. So there was no battles to, to be had over on this side, on the east side. And, but they had promised to cross over to help their countrymen, their nation, uh, on the west side of the Jordan, Numbers 32, 16 through 32, if you want to reference that. So that's, that's cool. They, they, they re- yeah, we're going to help you get your land, even though we have our own land. They're not going to be selfish. They're going to... They're going to go into battle with their countrymen. Verse 14, uh, B, the second part of 14 says, but you shall pass before your brethren armed, all you mighty men of valor, and help them. 
until the Lord has given your brethren rest. You're going to go in and you're going to help them until they rest. Amen. You're going to fight, fight, fight until they have rest. And may we fight, fight, fight in prayer until we have rest as a nation. Help us, God. As he gave you, it says, and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave to you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. And this same principle operates in the body of Christ. When one member is in need, all members suffer. If I should say to the hand, I have no need of you. And let's say a member is the hand and, you know, my mind says, I don't have no need of the hand. You cut it off. You're just cutting off a part of your own body. We're all the body of Christ. We need each other. We need to back one another in prayer. We need to back one another in encouragement. We need to back one another and sharpen one another and, and not dull one another and have, have purity in our speech and, and walk a, a life worthy of his calling by surrendering to Jesus and letting him live through us. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 26 is a reference to the, the common body and common need of the body, but we should never refuse to help our brother or our sister just because we're doing good and we don't want to be bothered. That's basically what it's saying here in Joshua. You know, they've got their land on the east side. They're all good. They don't have to fight anything, no wars to get their land. They're all protected, but they're saying, we're going to go in and God's saying, you're going to go in, and they agree. They're going to go in and fight for their countrymen as well. Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sisters. Fight for those who fight for you. It's amazing. And we'll win the battle together. We're fighting together. In unity, there's nothing that can stop the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church, Jesus said. And as we gather together over the airways or in person, We are unified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's amazing. Look at verse 16. All these people answered. So they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us, we will do. I love that. And wherever you send us, we will go. Amen. Nothing like people who hear their leader and obey. They hear the the one who's put in position of leadership and they respond favorably. That's a good thing. That puts a smile on your face and it almost makes you tear. I actually tear when I see a general leading his troops into battle and they're all for him and there's unity. That, that unity brings just such a, 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 you're just a wonder. It's a wonder because we are naturally de- disunified in, in, in confusion. And when there's order and there's a goal and there's a purpose and we all go in together, there's a, there's a blessing there. And God wants us to all come together as the body and pray and seek him and, and fight through this virus thing until it's gone. So here we see that, that Israel is in the kind of unity uh, that a nation needs to be essential for God's blessing to be upon them, for them to overtake the, um, the opposition and to inhabit the land that he gave them. Look at verse 17. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, they're telling Joshua, we will heed you. That's a good thing. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. That's a good out. I love that. If the Lord's not with you, we're not with you. <laughs> kind of thing. If the Lord's with you, man, we're with you. That's, that was kind of a good idea that they put in there when they said that, but the willingness of the people to receive Joshua as their leader replacing Moses was a confirmation of the Lord's word to Joshua that he would be with him and his people would follow him. That's a blessing. Look at verse 18. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him, he shall be put to death only be strong and be of good courage. So God gave Joshua the authority to kill any man who would disobey his, his command. Um, this should have strike, struck reverence uh, in the men to obey, uh, 
to obey Joshua. Um, but again, God reassures Joshua to be strong and of good courage. And, you know, so what about our world today? What about now? What about me here today? How does this book of Joshua, this first chapter, how does it speak to me? What's it really saying, at least personally to me as your pastor tonight? Um, I wrote, when it's like when we're born into this world, we're, we're kind of like the children of Israel. We're wandering around in the wilderness. We don't know really who we are. I mean, we may know where we come from. We might know some of our heritage. We might know um, a little bit about of, uh, if you're a certain ethnicity or where you come from. But you don't know ultimate questions. You, you start to begin, when you start to come of age, I remember when I did, you, you start to ask questions like, is there a God? Is there even a God? I mean, you start to ask questions like, what's my purpose? Like, why am I here? Um, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And the Bible answers most of these questions, if not all of these questions for us today from the book of Joshua, like how God prepared um, this land of promise for Joshua and for his people, for Joshua to lead them into. Um, God has prepared heaven for you, but not that we just want to go to heaven and die. That's not the purpose. But we have a hope of heaven. We have a hope that we know that after we die on earth, we're going to live forever somewhere. And it's a, it's a purpose. We have a, a hope of where we're going, not just who we are and where we're at. But God can actually answer the question of who you are. You're a child made in the image of God. It says that in Gen Genesis that God fashioned man after his image. Genesis 1.26. And in the image of God, God created man in his image. It's, it's amazing. Let us, I think it says in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. God created him. <laughs> so, so you're like, you're born and, and you don't know who you are. And then you come to Christ and you realize you're his child and now you know that you know I have a reason here. I, I know why you placed me here, God, that I might live for you, that I might serve you and just love one another as you loved me. And I fulfill all these laws, all these rules in just love. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin and gives you the strength to actually love like he loves you. And so I'm going to say a prayer. And if you'd like to accept Jesus into your heart right now, because he is coming again, and he's coming again very soon. He said it himself, I come quickly. In the book of Revelation 22, um, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, and I am coming. And he, said, he also said in that chapter, do not be afraid. He doesn't want you to fear this coronavirus. He doesn't want you to fear wars and earthquakes and rumors of wars and all these things that talked about in Matthew chapter 24. These are just birth pangs, the Bible calls it, before the coming of Christ. This is, it's happening. So let's say a prayer to receive Jesus right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time that you're giving me to understand that I need you. And I want to yield my life to you right now. I want to give you my heart, my life, my mind, my soul, everything that I am, I give to you. And I ask you would forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me, Lord, and make me fresh and new and, uh, like, uh, and clean like fresh fallen snow, Lord, and, and just pure. And I know, or at least... I'm learning, God, that I know that I won't be perfect, but that I will be forgiven, and that if I just keep coming back to you for forgiveness, you'll keep forgiving me as I learn to be more like you, and I get a little bit better every day to be more like you, Jesus, more loving, more caring, more helpful, more um, just there with people, more understanding and 
and that I would listen to others twice as much as I would speak to others, Lord, so that um, we could grow together and learn about you and, and learn to be more like you, Lord. So bless you, Lord. I bless you. I thank you. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. And give me peace. And, and I'm struggling, God. I need your peace. I need to understand. I need to know a few things of why and who and what, Lord. So I yield all those questions to you right now and ask that you would answer them for me through your Bible as I meditate on your word and and through prayer as I call out to you and then through my silence, Psalm 4610, as I just be still and know you are God and you're going to speak to me and speak to my heart. Save me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you just said that prayer and it's your first time or second time or tenth time, go to cclch.org, our website, and go to the top where it says prayer and click that and fill out the form and contact me. I want to give you resources to encourage you in your walk with God and we want to pray for you and with you. So God bless you and the Lord be with you. And I want to pray over you a blessing right now as you've uh, endured this message, but at least I hope it was a blessing. And um, I want to pray for health and blessing to you and your family right now as um, we're all going through this together. Uh, May we remember the Lord, may we remember his promises and meditating on his word. So Father, I pray for every person watching right now, God, that your hand of blessing would be upon them, Lord, your Uh, You'd protect them under the shadow of your wings, Lord God. You would fill them with wisdom in your word and and speak to them by your Holy Spirit, Lord, as uh, they cry out to you, as they call upon you, as they pray to you and ask you for help. Lord, we need your help. We trust you. We love you. We want you. We want you to be a part of our lives from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. I can't wait to get to you on Sunday. We're going to be uh, learning about Hosanna and Palm Sunday and what it all means with the um, laying down of the palm branches and why they cried out Hosanna and they were so excited about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that donkey. So God bless again and may you have peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Till later. Bye-bye.